Hi, I'm Tim Tyler and this is a review of this book, Evolution and the Levels of Selection by Samir Akasha. I previously read Samir's very short introduction to the philosophy of science. I thought that, that was good and so I had some idea of what this book would be like. The book contains an interesting and entertaining romp through the territory of group selection. It's what I call a firehose presentation. In other words, it's a long stream of technical material that doesn't let up. This is a good match for my own preferences in the science book. Samir co goes through practically every controversy in the field and provides insightful opinions and commentary. The book contains discussions of the price equation and its significance, causality, emergence, evolutionary transitions, the genes I view, species selection, the group selection controversy and kin selection. I thought the book was interesting and good. However, there were also quite a few parts of it which I disagreed with or did not like, and this is a reflection of the controversial nature of the subject matter. The book dates from 2006. Throughout most of the history of the field of group selection, many of its advocates considered it to be a superset of kin selection, often saying things like, relatedness is only one of many ways in which altruists can form groups which are then selected. However, in recent years, the quest to find things that group selection explained and that kin selection did not seems to have petered out, with many of the most vocal group selection advocates now procla proclaiming its equivalence to kin selection. Samir's book predates many of these developments, and I suspect anyone writing a book on the subject today would treat the topic rather differently. The book discusses kin selection only rather briefly. That is, there's a discussion about it in the chapter relating to the group selection controversy, and another one in the chapter about evolutionary transitions. Samir recognises the possibility that kin and group selection might be equivalent, and cites several sources who claim that it is, sometimes approvingly. However, most of this book makes no mention of kin selection. These days, I think few would approach group selection in this way. Kin selection has a rich and successful history, while group selection has spent most of its existence mired in confusion and controversy. Kin selection has been much better studied, so an obvious approach to many of the topics in this book would be to just use kin selection. However, it is hard to imagine this whole book being written in the language of kin selection. A good number of the issues just seem less important from that perspective. For example, in group selection there's, there's the issue of what counts as group. This broadly maps onto the issue of what counts as an individual in kin selection, yet this issue seems less controversial. Group selection also faces the issue of how to model partly overlapping groups, since most group selection models feature disjoint groups, yet the corresponding issue of partly overlapping families in kin selection seems less contentious. It's hard to escape the impression that the need for this book is partly because group selection is so awkward, difficult to understand, and poorly studied. Since kin selection is much better studied and much more widely used, it seems as though there would be less need for a philosopher to clear up misunderstandings in the field. Samir offers several digs at the views of Richard Dawkins in the book. He criticises the idea that evolution is based on replicators, offering Hull's comment about them passing on their structure intact to claim that the term replicator implies high fidelity copying. I think that practically everyone on both sides of this ag debate agrees that high fidelity copying is not necessary, and it's high fidelity information transfer that matters for cumulative adaptive evolution. No modern users of the term replicator in biology use the term in that way, and many of them have objected to this persistent misunderstanding. Of course, it's partly Richard Dawkins' fault for assigning an ordinary English word a counterintuitive technical meaning. Samir also criticises the genes I view on two grounds. First, he says that it ignores behavioural and environmental inheritance. That isn't true if you adopt an information theoretic definition of the term gene following G.C. Williams since then memes are a type of gene, and the genes I view remains valid. Samir also says that epistasis and modifier genes act against the genes I view, and this is strictly true, but some linearity in the expression of genes is really all that is required to make the genes I view useful, and since a linear component in the expression of genes is ubiquitous, this issue seems like a storm in a teacup to me. Like any complex technical book, there are some mistakes. The most embarrassing one that I spotted was where Samir offers an incorrect definition of inclusive fitness, including the augmenting, but not the stripping component, on page 145. Samir's explanations are usually clear, but sometimes the light fades. One such problem comes with the concepts of M MLS1 and MLS2, short for multi-level selection 1 and multi-level selection 2. Samir introduces these concepts by saying that they represent different focuses of interest on page 56. 
However, on page 59, we hear that MLS1 and MLS2 are distinct processes, and whether either occurs in a particular case is a matter of objective fact. At best, this sort of material is very confusing. Overall, this is a fine book, but I was left wondering if Samir had directed his energies in an appropriate fashion. The book will probably contribute to the modern group selection revival. However, that revival seems likely to be accompanied by the usual muddle and confusion that follows group selection around like a black cloud. The problems with group selection at this stage are more sociological than anything else. Yes, groups exhibit reproduction and differential reproductive success, and that affects the course of evolution. But the problem is that practically whenever group selection gets used, it results in junk science, or at best science that's inferior to that which would have been produced by using kin selection. Looking at the mess that group selection has caused in the evolutionary human sciences illustrates this point. Does the world really need more group selection? After reading Samir's book, I was still sceptical. Samir doesn't address sociological questions concerning whether the muddle associated with group selection means that it does more harm than good. Instead, he just wants to clear up the muddle. But in that case, why not use kin selection? It seems much better studied, much less confusing, and has produced much less junk science. What I think group selection needs most is clearly articulated reasons to use, it, to use it in place of kin selection. At the moment, the why not use kin selection question is challenging to answer. Maybe there are reasons, but this book doesn't really provide an answer. It doesn't even ask the question. Enjoy.